Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Scott O'Neill. I will tell you all about Scott in just a moment. Grace Under Pressure is a live interview show that poses questions to thought leaders and doers like Scott, who are making our world a better place. Uh, we focus on the topics of grace, which are generosity, respect, compassion, acting for others, and energizing the organization. So welcome, Scott. It's a pleasure to have you on the show today. So, John, the pleasure is mine, and I love the topic with which you teach and preach, and I, I can't tell you how much the world needs more of your message right now. So it, it comes at a good time in my life. I think I think I could speak for the world that we need more of you and more grace in our world. Well, we need more grace. I don't know if we need more of me, <laughs> but you're very kind. So I want to tell everybody about you, and uh, you are the CEO of Harris Blitz Sports and Entertainment, which is most people don't know, but they know who you own and manage, including the Philadelphia 76ers and the New Jersey Devils. You've got more than 20 years experience in the NBA, NHL, and the NFL, and you're a mover and shaker in professional sports and have been throughout most of your career. So, and you were also in the enter quote event and entertainment business through Prudential Center, which is a top center there. Uh, you're a widely um, uh, quoted speaker and executive and highly rated and all that. And before that, you were, before coming to Philly, you were in Madison Square Garden, which is a pretty good job. I don't know many people that would leave that, but good for I, Philly that you I, did. I left, I left that okay, you know? <laughs> John, it sounds like you've been talking to my mom. I my mom write my bio. I don't know if you have the same thing. My mom, she's very active. She writes my bio. She usually adds charming. Um, <laughs> Well the, well, the reason I, 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 you actually went to Villanova, which was, I'm not going to hold that against Get you. Get up. No <laughs> players allowed on this call. But you redeemed yourself because you have an MBA from Harvard Business School. So, And you have three lovely children, and you live in outside Philadelphia. Um, anyway, you are here because you wrote a wonderful book that we're going to talk about. I can see over your left shoulder called Be Where Your Feet Are. And we're going to talk all about that. But first of all, I got to you gonna uh, earn your supper here. So, what's the out? I'm a huge sports fan, or used to be. So, what's the outlook for professional sports coming out of our pandemic, Scott? So, well, John, um, the pandemic brought so much hardship for so many people, and and I, I don't want to make light of some of those who lost loved ones and um, or lost their businesses or were hospitalized. But for a lot of us there was a lot of joy that came through the pandemic. I mean, uh, it starts with my family dinners at home. I hadn't been to a family dinner in 25 years. And by the way, they are wonderful. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, so I said my fair share of grace at our family dinner. But, um, but, but what I learned when I was off the treadmill for a bit and, and got to, to take a little bit of a longer lens into the world was I rediscovered the why. You know, we work, I work hard in this business. I mean, we are 150 nights a year, you get home at midnight and you're back at it in the morning. And I don't, I don't say I'm not, I don't need a, the, the world's um, smallest violin. I really don't. I love what I do and have always appreciated this opportunity. Um, but the why matters. I think the why matters more now than anything. And so, so, and the reason I'm taking so long to answer your question is, is once you understand the why, the what becomes pretty simple. And the why for me now about live sports and entertainment is that we're meant to bring people together and create connection. We're going to give you escapism. We're going to let you come and rediscover your inner child. You're going to scream and shout and dance and high five and hug and perfect stranger. And we're going to come together and create community. And that's what we've been missing. And that's what we're lacking. And when we see the mental health challenges and differences happening in the world today, I think a lot of that is because we're not meant to be alone. We're not meant to be masked running into a store and running out and hopefully not making eye con a contact with anybody. We're not meant to have fear of a mailman coming to our front door delivering a package and um and we have a lot of healing to do and i think sports and entertainment can play a, a big role in that as far as the business goes we all got s slaughtered i mean uh, I, I guess that would be putting it kindly or nicely <laughs> <laughs> it was it was as bad and rough as as uh, i have ever can remember um and having been through 9 11 and and having been through the 08 financial crisis this was those two combined times a thousand. I mean, it was uh, was a very difficult situation, um, but I I'm 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 so hopeful. I'm, I'm filled with with hope. I mean, I, I can tell you just our small organization, which may or may not be representative of the world, but 
but we've got a V-shaped recovery coming back. Like our 21-22, we, we have a June 35th, so our 21-22 um, fiscal year, you know, it starts July 1st to, July, to June 30th, um, is, is shaping up to be much better than what we had 1920 pre-pandemic. So, so that to me is a good indication that the world is coming back. We need connection. The fans want to come back. We have a, a, you know, a, a picture of that during the playoffs. But it's, it's, I think this, this industry has a place to stay. I think we matter. Um, and I think we have to serve our purpose for the, for the communities we, we live, work, and play. Great. I want to jump into your book, but I want to lay a little prelude because part of the book is you wrote the book because you wanted to address your challenges and conflicts. Scott, didn't anybody tell you as a successful executive, you write about your triumphs? But <laughs> you know, I, I, it's funny. I'll tell you a funny story. Um, I was in the bubble in, in Orlando. For those of you who don't follow the NBA, um, the, the, the league office took, took the whole league and dropped them into this little um, ESPN zone in, in, uh, in Orlando. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to be able to go down there. My first game, I'm by myself. Like, literally, I watched it. I was the only fan in the NBA game. Like, so unthinkable, you yeah. know. And it was just like, it was such a unique experience. The second game, they had these huge, this is before we kind of knew what was going on with, with the, the virus. So huge plexiglass separating the, the people. So at the next game, there were three people. And I looked to my left, and it's Adam Silver, who I used to work for, the commissioner of the NBA. And I looked to my right, and it's Bob Iger the CEO of Disney, like think about like how surreal this experience is. And, uh, and I got a chance to speak to him through the glass and I said, Hey, Bob, I love your book. And he said, Oh, thank you. And I said, here's what I love about it. You talked about having a, a nervous breakdown before you got named CEO of Disney. And he said, well, that's not what I expected to hear. And I said, Bob, like the world needs more vulnerability. Like we live in this Instagram world and this Facebook world. And, and I don't, I want to see pictures of kids getting into fancy colleges and, you know, um, vacations to Cabo and my girl, daughter scored the winning goal. All this stuff's great. I, I want you all to keep posting wonderful things about what's happening. We just can't get lulled into thinking that that's what real life is. And, um, and so, so no, this book is, is not, not a victory lap. So, uh, my friend called me and he said, this is the most surprising book I've ever read. <laughs> Good surprise or bad surprise. He said, Scott, it's wonderful. It made me cry. I did not expect to pick up a book for you and cry. Well, that's that's great. And I appreciate your honesty and, and, and shaping it into something which is so important, which is vulnerability, which is an attribute of grace. So I got to get to the title. Um, I'm going to guess in my mind, but why? Tell me about the title. Be where your feet are. So, so I, um, I'm a hair quirky, if you haven't picked that up. I mean, <laughs> no, you're <laughs> straight down the line. Harvard yeah. MBA, oh, kind of boring, you know. So. I'm right down the line. I'm, I'm surprised you're not working on Wall Street. I just really <laughs> don't understand. So, yeah. No, I am. Um, and so I, 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 have, I definitely have things that I say quite a bit. Um, you know, as, as a leader, you, you learn over time that repetition mm -hmm. is, a, is a great asset in terms of driving change. And so, so you'll oftentimes hear me. Um, at work and at home and at church, I, 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 my, I try to be the same person, use the same language wherever I am. And I, I say, be where your feet are, which, which in my language, my parlance translates very directly to phone down, head up. That's what it means to me. Um, and so, you know, and, and I can walk down with my phone and one of my daughters will say, dad, be where your feet are. I'm like, mm -hmm, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Out of the mouths of babes. So. And at, at work, uh, we have cell phone tables, you know, and, and you come in. To a conference table, you put your cell phone there and you go sit down because I want you to look to your left. I want you to look to your right. I want you to communicate. I want you to stop making the world a big elevator. Like we have to get our heads up and we have to talk. And not only about what's happening at work, but what's happening at home. Like talk about another gift of Zoom. It's like I've seen you in your PJs. I've seen you with your kids, your pets. I've seen your bathroom. I've seen your living room. I mean, what a gift. Yeah. Because we need to understand who we are um, so that we can do better um, with, with and for each other. So, so the title is, is simply about the, 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 the sense of, can we create meaningful moments? Okay. Because phone down, head up, just gets you to the to starting line. That gets you nowhere. Yeah. Um, and then we have this, this, I have this notion of just, I, I've talked about it quite a bit. It's like, I don't believe in balance. Every, I've spoken all over the world. First question, second question is always, how do you find work-life balance? I'm like, I don't believe in work-life balance. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I believe in creating meaningful moments where I am. I believe in being where my feet are and engaging with you right now, John, because I'm with you. And if I don't want to be here, I shouldn't be here. And if you don't want me as your guest, you shouldn't have had me here. 
But I, I can't see it. No. <laughs> I don't want you reading a book right now or, or checking your stocks or whatever, whatever people do. You know, scrolling through Twitter or TikTok videos. I, I, I had this, I had this notion that we, we just time is our most precious resource. Well, you. That's just why I. I mean, all of us business books uh, authors say that I always have these subtitles, and and subtitles are sometimes half the book. But you, you have one that's really zings, and I love it. It's uh, be pre be present, grounded, and thriving. So I, you talked about the present. So what does it mean to be grounded? So. Well, I, you know, I think that has a lot of meanings to a lot of people. Um, and I think in, in my business, uh, it's, a, it's a business that's um, full of like false bravado. Um, I, I would say like overconfidence was probably the wrong word, but bravado, I think is the best. Yeah. And, uh, and we have to be strong and be tall, you know? And, um, and what I, what I've found is, is that um, you seem to get more done with my brother says an, an ounce of humility and a handful of grace. <laughs> we to and put them together, and he right. said, "It's amazing what you can accomplish with just an ounce of humility and a handful of grace." And 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 I think that's about being grounded. That that um, to me is is the, the definition. And I think also, and you allude to it because you said it too. And it's knowing yourself, um, which is can be a lifelong exercise. Would you not? Uh, would you disagree or not, Scott? So yeah, I think it's a journey. I I um. You know, I, I think back and having three daughters, you know, my daughter. <laughs> Those, as, as the old Catholic tradition was, they all get a higher place in heaven, young man, for that. Three daughters. <laughs> yeah, well, well I would have earned it. I'll tell you that. And, um, <laughs> I have one. Who's, who's, I'm now a grandfather, so oh, I, I get all the riches of it. That's so. the fun part, yeah. Um, but but I, I will say um, that I, I've, I've learned so much from my, from my daughters. So, so many different ways, and I. And I, and I think there's so many teachers in life. Um, and I, I give you two quick stories, if, if you might. I know I, I seem to talk in stories and it takes up too much time. That's right. Anyway, um, my, my oldest daughter, Alexa, is, is she's a world beater. I, I told you before, she painted this amazing, well, this amazing um, painting when she got back from Zambia. She was working, sleeping, sleeping on a dirt floor in a tent and, and working with orphans, orphans. And then the next summer, she... Uh, worked in a Syrian refugee camp. And I, I, don't, I don't tell you that, but say, that, hey, she's better than everybody. Yeah. You're like... Huh. She's passionate about changing the world. And, and I totally dig that about her. When she was 14 years old, she came home with a report card that I almost couldn't believe. I, I'm a like a uber high achiever, like one of the loony, loony birds. And and I, I had a conversation. I said, hey, this this isn't acceptable. And she's like, I don't, I'm not you, dad. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> dad moment, right? I was like, well, yeah. I don't want you to be me. I yeah. I let's talk about this. And um, and what, what I what I learned is 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 I, you know, she ended up having a learning disability, which I didn't discovered until four years later, which took away my dad of the year award, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Other than that, um, I'm amazing. No, um, but uh, I, what I learned from her was, um, was something really amazing is, is, is she wasn't made for school. Um, she's not made to study chemistry or mm -hmm. calculus or mm -hmm. quite frankly, sit down for 20 minutes at a time. Yeah. And, and so what I, what I learned from her is, is like, I had to meet her where she is. Yes. Um, and that was a, that was different for me. I was a high charging, ambitious executive trying to like take on the world and do deals. And, and then I had to meet her where she was, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that was not a place where I was. And I, it changed me as a leader and as a, as a husband and a father. And I, and we have a wonderful uh, connection and relationship and, um, I think this was where your brother's comment comes in, an ounce of humility and a handful of grace. <laughs> right, right. And, and I, I just, uh, just to fast forward that story, she ends up going to a school called uh, uh, UVU and they had a 98% acceptance rate. And I said, all the only thing I said to her, I was like, who are they not accepting? Like, who are those people? <laughs> like, who are they? Like, and, uh, but, and she's thriving. You know, she's just, She's had a three, seven, three. I don't mean to brag about her, her grades, yeah. but she had, I mean, I literally in high school was like, Hey, just graduate kid. You can do this. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, that's where we were you oh, know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. because I didn't think she was good. Like I didn't, it might not have been for her. And I, and, and me, I'm, you know, I hadn't gotten a B in my life, a B <laughs> let alone what she was getting. And so I, yeah. you know, that's, so then how do I translate that to be, to, to be leading and managing people? Well, guess what? The whole world out there and they don't look a lot like I do. 
And then my my youngest and and Alexa is now I mean she's driving she's interning with the Jazz and she's she just she's a special kid in in her way and she's gonna find her way and I so you know and my my youngest is um she's a, a heavy introvert and um uh, suffers from social anxiety you know it's um, yeah. very difficult for her to go into social settings and meet new people and change is very hard for her she's got some heavy OCD so it's hard and um and as I was as I was not connecting with her when she was young i started reading i, I don't know any anywhere else to do it i just try to solve problems and you know in marriage and with kids and sometimes like that's not what they want to hear but i just want to learn you know yeah. so, so as i began to 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 read i, I was at this um, retreat with her and this uh, woman karen gordon had us write love letters to each other and like it sounds so simple right right write a love letter to your daughter like i write them little cute notes like i love you kid i put them in a lunchbox i do all that kind yeah. of stuff i had never sat down and said like that had that meaningful conversation says, here's why you matter to me. Here's why you're special in this world. Um, here's why you complete this family. All that, the stuff that you know you, you feel, but you don't write, you don't say mm -hmm. it. And we had to read it to oh. each other. I, of course, was a teary mess. But, but what was flying through my head as I'm reading it to her was not, hey, she's awesome. I kept thinking was, holy moly. I'm thinking of all the people who I've ever worked with that I've run out because I didn't understand the power of introverts. I didn't understand that they're, mm. that they're more creative, that they're more intuitive, that they have more creative problem solving. Because I wanted to debate and I wanted you to stand up and defend your position. And I wanted you to, and I'm like, but that's not the way the world works for everybody. Nope. And so the people that were good at that were super performers and they were celebrated and heralded, but the ones that weren't, weren't. Yeah. So I, I look at these moments and talk about being grounded, yeah. being grounded. Do you want to get grounded? Be humble. Listen, stop talking, learn something. <laughs> no, that's true. I, I love what you say about introverts because it's so true. Um, and so many leaders, uh, and I'm sure you found this and maybe the hard way, Scott, is our typical pers uh, our, our, our typical image of a senior executive such as yourself is an out and out extrovert, social butterfly, or comfortable in crowds and all that. So many um, effective leaders are introverts and they They've learned coping, how to step out of themselves when necessary. But the great value I think they bring, and I think what you thought, is the value of silence, just observing. And, you know, you and I are talkers. We're so busy talking, we're not listening. <laughs> no, <laughs> At least for me. I know my use. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I just, I, you know, I, I think about um, young people today and, and what leading teams looks like today. And it's different because, they don't care if you're an extrovert or introvert. They don't care if you're rah-rah or, or a thinker. They, you know what they want? They want your authentic self. That, that is what the young people want. They want to look you in the eyes and say, okay, this woman or this guy, he's for real. Or she's for real. She, I mean, she says what she means. She means what she says. I can follow this woman. You know, that's what people are looking for right now. So uh, it's, it's a fascinating time to lead today. Related to this in, in, in the concept of presence, but also what we were talking about silence is you have a concept in your book called um, stillness. So tell us about that and how the, does someone like you who's a hard charger achieve stillness? So, so I had this executive coach named Trisha Nadoff when I worked at, I was president. I know Trisha, yeah. You know her? Uh, she, she, well, you know how wonderful she is. Yes. She's, she's an elite, elite leader, elite coach, elite human being. And um, she, she, my mom sent her to me. My mom said, hey, <laughs> that's a first. I have yeah. never oh, heard God. of a mother <laughs> arranging for a coach. Now that is a first. <laughs> yeah, no, but my mom is, was a former leadership developer and coach. And so she, I mean, she was seeing me struggle. I mean, I, I, I'm, you know, I want to be, you know, so Trisha came in. She's like, you're a warrior. I was like, that's right. And she's like, no, 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 Scott, that's not a good thing. I was like, of course it's a good thing. It's like, yeah. no, no, no. Scott, I want you to, to breathe. I want you to meditate. I was like, have you lost your mind? <laughs> and look, you say, no, no, no Scott, yeah. you need to become a sage. I'm like, I don't want to be a sage. <laughs> but you want to just do the, the next kill. I'm like, that's right. I want, the yeah. next kill. I want to grow. I want to do this. I want to do that. And, and, and her, her counsel, which I did, I couldn't even, I was, man, I was just in a different zone. I, I didn't understand it until three or four years later. And the thought of meditating, it's funny, she said it to me, and I was in the in the uh, cab with Josh Sapin, who's uh, running AMC Networks at the time as part of our the MSG bigger family. And he says, Scott, uh, do you mind if I meditate? I'm like, in the cab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I was like, and this is literally after my session with Trisha, and I said, yeah. are, are you serious? Yeah. Like, yes, I meditate every day. And I was just like, 
So I just watched him. His head's like banging against the, the window and he's, he's in the zone. And, um, and so I knew I had to explore what stillness looked like. Yeah. Um, I wasn't ready at the time, but then, then, you know, I, I, um, you know, I went through this, um, conversion, uh, you know, I got baptized in a church, church yeah. Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. And I, I went through this, um, you know, went through the temple and there's all kinds of stillness in this holy place and started reading scriptures and started getting on my knees and praying and doing the stuff that nobody ever wants to talk about, yeah. but I'm okay talking about it. Yeah. Um, because for, for me, I, it, it was a, it was a time in my life when I needed, I needed peace and I needed comfort and I needed stillness and I, and I found it in the temple and I, yeah. and I found it on my knees in the morning and night. And, um, and I'm better when I do it. And what I talk about at work, um, because church, church and faith is really hard to talk about at work for a lot of people. It's mm-hmm. not, me, but mm-hmm. I, I don't want to like ever put pressure on anybody to do what they don't want to do. I think you, you, you have to find your own connection with, with a, you know, a higher power or, or yourself or however you, you see the world. Sure. Um, but, but I do believe that you have to find stillness and, and it's 10 minutes a day and, and meditation is a wonder. And by the way, I, I learned how to meditate. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're not banging your head against a window. Right. <laughs> um, but, but, um, but also like I advocate for yoga and I advocate for sitting outside and listening to the birds chirp or going right. for a nice peaceful walk. Um, but, but, but without your phone and without music playing and, and in the woods where you can find calm, like our, our souls need to heal. Our minds need to heal. And, mm-hmm. and, and other than sleep, there's only one way to get that rejuvenation, and, and that's through finding stillness. So I'm going to uh, throw this one. So then the pandemic, putting aside all the business challenges, um, and you did mention one positive. You were able to uh, sit and have dinner with your family on a regular basis. So was the pandemic something positive for you in your sense of inner peace? Total gift. Yeah, I, I feel uh, more, more, con- more connected um, to my faith, more connected to my wife. I'm more connected to my children. I feel like I'm mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally as healthy as I've been in my life. Um, so I, I, I think it's a, it's a blessing. I think that treadmill, man, speed picks up on that treadmill. It does. And uh, oh, yeah. if you get off that thing now and again. Um, right. Now you have something which I thought I found fascinating. And it's the concept you, you came up with. I've never heard this phrase before. The leadership constitution. Tell us what that means or what it is. So. Right. I was, I was in the, do you know, I answer every question with a story. Have you recognized that? I, I, <laughs> well, I think it, uh, you wouldn't happen to be Irish now. Would you? <laughs> I know, I'm Irish, half Italian. I got yeah. that correct going. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I was at my, my brother um, runs a healthcare tech company called Get Well Network. Um, we founded it. It's an amazing company. Re- redefining interactive patient care around the world. But nonetheless, um, and I saw on the back of his, right behind his, his desk was this, you know, it was actually his leadership constitution. And he walks in, I'm like, what is this? And he said, well, that, that's, I said, I work with Rich Hill, Gabriel Consulting in Chicago. So you need, you need to talk to him. And so I started working with him. He's been working with my team for eight years. And it's his, it's his, so I, I don't, I don't want to claim it. It's not mine. Yeah. Um, but I, I embrace it. So, so the idea is this. Um, the idea is that you answer two questions. I declare that I am. And you can count on me to be. So I declare that I am dot, dot, dot. And you can count on me to be. And this is not your aspirational self. This is your best self. This is who you are at your core. Okay. Um, and the idea is, is that you, you spent some time. It took me about two and a half, three weeks to, to write this, get feedback from people who love me enough to tell me the truth. Um, and then to face the music. And then read it enough times when you know what's resonating. And I can tell you that for me, it's the best temperature check. Because when I'm, when I'm off or... Um, you know, not, not, not being my best self. I can mm-hmm. often go back to my leadership constitution and read it and can find specific lines that I'm not living. Okay. Uh, but most importantly, I'd I, say is a leadership. I like, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I like what uh, that is. Cause you're, what you're doing is you're taking something which could be abstract and you're talking about self-knowledge and self-awareness, and then you're making it concrete with something that this leadership constitution, and there's an operative concept in there that was really resonates. You shared it with other people and it took you a while to do it. So you're getting feedback as you're developing. That's that's a strong concept. So. It, I appreciate that. But here's what, here's what the hard thing for a lot of people is, you have to read it out loud. Oh. Man. And so think of how awkward it is. I have that in my, my, um, or my office. I have in two places, my office and my bathroom. So can you imagine like my wife walking in and be like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> My leadership constitution. Yeah. Monday, honey. Yeah. Um, 
And that's actually what, what I'm doing. And, I, and, 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 and this format I absolutely love. You know, I declare that I am, and you can count on me to be. Um, but, I, but I talk about another fr- friend of mine in the book, Sean Nelson, the founder of Love Sack. And, and he, he sets out, he just wrote a little intention for himself and said, this is what I want to be at my best self. And he reads it every day. And I, look, we, we, I think we misinterpret the way, the way or, or we, miss, um, we, we don't fully understand the power of words and how we can impact and influence our subconscious to put the intentions out in the world so we can live better and live better life. <laughs> You know, you hit a uh, thing. Yes, we do overlook the power of words. And here's a concept that that uh, our friend uh, Marshall Goldsmith often talks about. And it's sort of the, it, it, it's the power of, I'm going to call it the power of the king, which is your words as a CEO are, you mention something and it's an order when you're really musing out loud. So how, how do you balance that? So well, that's so hard. You know, when I was young, I just remember I worked for this amazing guy, John Spott, who worked for him. I was an assistant. He was the president. But I remember, I remember what he would wear. I wanted to dress like him. I remember what he would say. I wanted to talk like him. When he said hello to me, my day would be better than when he just walked by me. And meanwhile, I'm a marketing assistant. Yeah. And, and I, I, I always think back at that. It's like we forget about the impact and influence we have. I say it to my team all the time, the, the, the folks I get to work with every day. So I'm like, they're watching you. They're listening. They are fully aware of the energy that you're putting out in the world. And, uh, and I, I, I think that's such a good insight in, in meetings. Like, and I like to talk and I like to get out there and I'm anxious and I, le- I love to. And so I think how hard it is for me to, to not weigh in when somebody says, what do you think about X? It's hard for me to say, I love it. I don't love it. I hate it. I think you should change X. I, 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 you know, I have to physically hold myself back because if I do, if I go first, I steer the whole conversation. All right. That is bad leadership and bad management. That's right. You are never going to get the best outcome out of your team. <laughs> and that's good. So tell me about the leadership constitution. I'm guessing you have shared it with your senior team, correct? So, yes, yeah. and, and do they remind you of it? <laughs> if I have it here, I'm going to read you mine. Yeah. I do have it here. You want me to read you mine? Yeah, sure. Put my glasses on. Okay. Can't see a thing these days. Okay. I declare that I am passionate okay. and I'm I have, of leaders. You have I've got some of these bags that they're not going to go through your phone after. You're wearing my heart on my hands. Parents have also carbon. Oh, excuse, excuse me. Uh, Gail, I'm sorry. This is one of the most exciting things about being live. <laughs> Live TV is amazing. Well, I have now. Um, I we have our two grandchildren staying with us, and I forget that that, that they have voices. So, anyway. <laughs> so, so I'm gonna start again. I apologize to our audience and to you, Scott. Oh no, I kept it going. I think they're yeah. still engaged. Yeah. Okay. This is my leadership constitution. I declare that I am a passionate and authentic leader of leaders who feels a gravitational pull towards talent and character. I wear my heart on my sleeve. I love people and being part of a team. I get energy from helping others and would give the shirt off my back to a stranger and anything, anytime to a friend. I am a family first, high integrity and surprisingly sensitive change agent who is confident, caring and intellectually curious. This fuels competitive drive that at times feels like a giant chip on my shoulder. So that is what I'm declaring. Let me tell, I'll read some of the, you can count on me to be just so you get a sense. Yeah. You count on me to bring positive energy into my space, exude urgency and push you, challenge you, nudge you, and raise the bar beyond your expectations and sometimes what you think is reasonable. You can count on me to laugh with you, cry with you, and love you, even when you won't laugh, haven't <laughs> cried, and don't feel loved. You can count on me to root for you today, every day, and always. Share the most personal thoughts, emotions, stories, highs and lows, because I'm okay with it and who I am. <laughs> you kind of mean enjoy the roller coaster of life, whether going forward, backward, and upside down. There's a few more there, but, but yeah. you get the gist. Well, thank you. Uh, it, it, we talk about vulnerability. I think you kind of laid it all out there. And I also liked your your act of humility. I'll call it an act of humility. There was something in there you said that's a, a chip on my shoulder. So that's <laughs> that's good. It, I don't know if you can see it, but it, it sits there. You know? <laughs> well, I mean, Scott, we could go for another hour, but we're coming to the close to the end. And I always ask our guests just a story of grace. Do you have something you want to share with us, please? So. Boy, grace um, is su- such a wide topic. I, I was, I would say this. Um, you know, I, uh, I had something really unfortunate happen to me. I'll tell you. 
Um, and my best friend took his own life. And that's the, the impetus for me writing the book. Um, and um, I learned a ton about myself. And I learned a ton about grief. And I learned a ton about depression and mental, mental health issues and problems. Um, but more so those and how they affect me and impact me directly. And, and the grace, I will tell you, that I've experienced when I was going through my six weeks of darkness um, was just the light that people brought to me. Um, and, you know, it can be as simple as just a, just a reach out, just a, a text, a card, a note, a call. And so I, my, 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 my reflection on, on grace is that if you're watching this, just reach out to somebody. If you're feeling full, good for you. Somebody isn't in your life. Yeah. And, and the world, the universe, Heavenly Father, somebody will send you an intention. Listen to it. Like, be open to the intention to reach out and make the world better. You nailed it. It's exactly what great grace can be um, transformative. I've had so many people so, tell stories, life-saving stories. Yours is both kind of a blend of uh, a transformative story, but also thank you for that, uh, uh, the acknowledgement. Grace can be something just so simple. And you've yeah. said it as a text. Reach out. So. Okay. Love all. Thank you, Scott. You have been a terrific guest, um, and I thank you. And um, uh, I'm going to send people to your website so you can get your book. So tell us what the book is. <laughs> Be where your feet are. All right, great. Be grounded. And with that, Scott, we're going to close out. So thank you. Appreciate you, John. Do your thing.